Okay, we are in Genesis chapter 3, as I said last week. I think this is a very critical bi uh, chapter in the whole Bible because it lays the foundation why we're even Christians. And last week we just got started. We went through chapter 2 and the, uh, and the creation of at least individuals of Adam and Eve. <clears throat> and God placed them in the Garden of Eden. He provided everything they needed. They were to till the soil. They were to be good stewards of all that God had created for them. He says, everything is yours. But he put one little caveat, caveat on it that there's a certain tree out there in the middle that I really don't want you to eat from. So don't, you cannot eat from the fruit of the tree of good, of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Did he say cannot or don't? He said don't. No. No. That's different than cannot. Exclamation mark. So, <laughs> as like most human beings, With free will. when you're told not to do something, that's all you kind of think about. Right. You can have everything under the sun, but the one thing you can't have... That's what you want. That is what you want. So, uh, <clears throat> and in chapter 3, we start talking about <coughs> that tree. And it just said the serpent was more crafty than any living thing. So what, what, what verse are you starting? Starting with verse 1 of chapter oh, 3. Oh, okay. Uh, of the field which Yahweh God had made, and he said to the woman... And this is the serpent saying, can it really be that God has said that you cannot eat of every, or can it be, can it really be that God has said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the servant of the tree, or of the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you ye touch it, lest you die. And that's where we ended last, because she kind of put a comma bud on what God's command was. It doesn't say ye, it says touch. So they couldn't touch it? Well, she what? said... She you must not eat fruit from the tree. What did she How say? Oh, I see. You must, 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 must not eat and you must not touch it. God, well, God, is that what God told them? God only said you're not to touch or eat of it. She added, we're not even to touch it. We're going to die. And, uh, which is probably good thinking. If you can't eat it, why get that close to it that you want to touch it? And basically, it does kind of talk about the progression or the temptation of sin is usually it doesn't smack you right in the face like a two before. It kind of creeps up on you. And you want to get close, and the closer you get, da -da 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 -da, and then you're kind of hooked into it. But anyway, and then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was desirable to the eyes and the tree was pleasant to make one knowing. So she was drawn closer to it. She knew she was not supposed to eat of it. She said she wasn't even to touch it, but that wasn't what God said. Don't eat of it. <clears throat> and she took, uh, sh uh, and then took she of the fruit thereof, along with her, and he did eat. Oops, I skipped a place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll go back to the good English. <laughs> okay. Knowing of, and then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit and ate. And then she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And what I tell people is, at least Eve had a dialogue about what she should or should not do. But when it came man's turn, Adam's turn, 
she just said eat and he ate. No <laughs> questions. She just did what he was He told. was supposed to be the leader of the household. <laughs> well, actually not at this point in time. Oh, okay. And, and you know, actually at this point in time, God may have told Eve not to touch it because <laughs> this was before sin. So a lying is a sin, so she can maybe she's just passing it on for me. And I will say there are certain church traditions out there that think that this fruit was sex. So having sex on a tree? Yeah. Good. <laughs> so who knows? I don't think. He's what said that title, <laughs> Huh. And then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. So they blew it. They had it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was to be wise. Actually, it's kind of the idea of I'm I'm like God now. I know. But the minute sin entered when they <coughs> disobeyed God, it tells us they saw that they were naked. Sin kind of exposes you. And then they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So the other thing is sin kind of will expose you and you will do everything in your power to cover it up. How big are fig leaves? <clears throat> Not very big. Not very big. Yeah. <laughs> but she blew it. Then she had to start sewing for it. So we know that sin <laughs> broke the relationship or damaged the relationship between man and woman. And God. But we're not there yet. This, what we just read is once they <coughs> disobeyed God, Something happened in between them. And what now has to be covered? And I mean, because they're covering their shame and their guilt. And they're trying, and the next verse says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So, then is what you said. Sin also broke the relationship between them and God. And what was the first thing they did? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Sin you want to cover up. And now, I preached a sermon not long ago that everything's going to be exposed. <laughs> when it, and when it comes to God, you really can't cover it up. So, your mom and dad might not be watching you. Your spouse might not be watching you. The cops might not be watching you at the moment. <laughs> um, but... People know, no matter how badly you cover it up. And God knew. I mean, why did God, well, even have to ask them? Because he already knew. And that's why when we say in 1 John, it says, you know, to keep in that relationship with God, we're supposed to confess mm -hmm. our sins. Right. And I said, and I've always, in my explanation of that is, we're not telling God so he knows, because he knows. And we're not telling him so we know, because we already know. So there must be another reason why we have to keep confessing to God, because everybody knows, at least between the two of you. And that is simply to keep talking with him. So verse 9, when God asks them, where are you, is that... <clears throat> That's a rhetorical question where he's trying to make them see if they'll lie or... Well, it's a story. It's a narrative. Yeah. And they're hiding. <clears throat> I'm sure God doesn't have... I mean, this whole business with God is, see if I can get this big, big fancy word out. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. 
which means they put God in terms of man. And we know God doesn't walk around in a garden. And uh, maybe he did. <laughs> He's garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And then God said, Well, how did you know that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, I didn't. The woman did. She made me. Uh, the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So he's trying to blame God in a sense. Well, yeah. it's this woman you well, gave it, it, it's it's yeah. Sin is a blame. I mean, you're trying to cover game. it up. Yeah. You're trying not to take responsibility for it. And so it is a name game. Blaming. Uh, Rationalizing. Not like I've always said. The devil gets blamed for a lot of things he didn't do. Uh, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil didn't make anybody do anything that you didn't want to do. He might encourage you, but ultimately you make the decision. Can the devil put you in circumstances, though? The devil will tempt you because what I, in fact, I, I think one of devil means one of devil or Satan. One means accuser and one's a tempter. Is even the example we have of Jesus? He's in a horrific situation. He's out in the wilderness. He is fasting for forty days and forty nights. And his condition isn't the very best, and Satan comes to him to tempt him. And that's the nature of Satan. He's going to tempt you, but he isn't ever going to make you do it. So it's when you're vulnerable. It's when you're vulnerable. When you put yourself kind of out there, it's like Eve got pretty close to the tree and started looking at it. And there's things out there that are very desirable, <coughs> at least on the surface. And I mean, it's if you you know that's why they say fleece sin temptation. Don't put yourself into that situation because if you get close enough, it's going to smack you. And the closer you get, and the more desirous you have of it, the less your strength to resist is. Yeah. So, don't be flirting around with somebody who's not your wife. Don't put yourself because in it position. might be innocent, but it can quickly change. And you don't know when it changes. So, just don't put yourself in a situation that you could succumb to. Or when you find yourself in one exit. <laughs> or exit. Yeah. And so, but when it happened, and the story is telling us, it created havoc between the man and the woman. Even though they didn't sin against each other, they had sinned against God. Once they broke that command of God, it changed the relationship. And what we're learning now, it also changed the relationship between them and God. Because not only are they are covering up from each other, they're trying to hide and cover up from God. And, and, and I think the story isn't so much about God's perspective, but it is from our perspective. Thinking that we can literally hide from God. And we really can't. We'll get along without God. Now it kind of gives us the impression God is ignorant here, but I think pretty sure he knew what was going on that the difference in their relationship all of a sudden, because it was a close communion or fellowship they had with each other, but now he can just, you know, why are you hiding? Why are you trying to cover up? And it's interesting, and who told you 
you were naked. And the knowledge of that came from sin. That sin literally opened their eyes in a whole different perspective. And they're looking at the world differently now. And they're looking at God differently. And they're looking at each other differently. So, well, is that because they ate of the apple yes. of sin and the knowledge? They didn't eat of the apple, they ate of the fruit. Oh, the fruit. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, because of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Not only are they learning what good is, they've discovered what evil was. And, and it's, let's keep us here, how far do I want to go? And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The servant received me and I ate it. And so it's the circle of blame. Like I said, Satan gets blamed for a lot of stuff he didn't do. Satan doesn't make us do it. He will try to get us to do it. He will paint pictures and give you justification. But ultimately you have to decide whether you will do it or not. He'll do anything to get you to follow his evil point. But he's but he can only do He's not going to force you. He will try to entice you. Yeah. But ultimately, your you each individual is the one who decides they will partake or not partake. And then on the reverse side is then I says the Lord gets credit for a lot of things he wish he hadn't. A lot of things are done in this world in the name of the Lord, and, and they just cause me to cringe. Because it is not at all what like shooting in the life of doctor. Christ. <laughs> well, in the name of Christ. Picketing fallen soldiers. Oh. With, oh. I'm thinking, in the name of the Lord? Yeah. I mean, you hear that thrown out. And not that I'm making any equation here, but it's kind of the same in the name of Allah. I, we do this. And if there is such a person as Allah, I'm, I'm sure he's cringy. And then we're supposed to forgive him, right? That's what it says. Um, we're supposed to love him. However, that's a hard one to do. Well, we can love them and not love their behavior. Yes. So anyway... We Amy, have. Amy has a question. What? <laughs> what do you say to the people that say about Genesis? Well, um, if God knows everything, then it was His plan for us to sin, which I guess it well, is. Well, you're talking about predestination. And. I don't believe in predestination. I don't think the Bible talks about that. What do you, I'm not sure what the definition Well, basically, is. God created the heavens and the earth and, and everything in it, and he put it in the motion, and the what happens is what he designed to happen. And there's no choice about it. It just is. Which is, so when he created Matt, or Adam and Eve, he created them to sin. And that's not the way you can look at it. Because the choice always came back to both Eve and Adam. They did not have to eat. But the, what people say to me is, but God planned and knew before they, when he was creating them. He gave us the freedom of choice because he wants us to choose to love him. He doesn't want to create, in my way of looking robot. at it, a robot conditioned to love him. He has his angels. It is a freely given relationship. And no one causes you to sin except you. Mm -hmm. Now, this Satan might paint the most enticing picture. And he might even try to be very deceptive about it, but the ultimately any sin is destructive. Period. Yes, but that's. But. But does anybody force creation? you to lie? Does anybody force anyone to steal? Does anyone force you to do this? Anything. 
But does God know at the point of creation everything we're going to do? No. No, uh, and there is a difference between foreknowing and pre-foredoing. I mean, I think God can look out there and he sees what ha is going to happen. But he didn't cause it to happen. But some of us but he has a plan. are born into a Christian family. We've got to step up right there. I mean, that's a, mm -hmm. you know. You know yeah. I mean, I feel like I've been so blessed all my life. And you're born in America, in the United States. Yes, in the where, where I live, <laughs> where I was born. I mean, is well, that just the luck of the draw? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. It, you know, there is chance. I mean, some people are born, you know, what made me be born where I was versus somebody else. I mean, that's just the way it is. You have, basically, you have to deal with a lot dealt you. A lot what? The lot dealt you. Dealt mm -hmm. Oh, I was dealt just the most, I was the And some are. I have the most wonderful playing. husband. I have the most wonderful children. I'm so but the blessed. whole idea is, you choose, each person will make the choice. Now, this particular episode is the Garden of Eden experience. I said is representative of what everyone has to go through. Each <clears throat> one of us, one point in time in their life, have to decide if they're going to be obedient to God or do their own thing. And no one can make that decision for you. You will have to make that decision. And according to the Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans, he says, and as I observed out there in the world of mankind, no one has been making the right decision. For all have sinned, all have missed the mark, all have rebelled, all have turned their back on God. But I will tell you, when God created us, and this is where I differ from a lot of folks, he created within us the potential to be obedient. To be perfect. Just like Christ. Jesus <laughs> obeyed. The rest of us don't. No. I said it last sermon. Was it my sermon Sunday? Yeah. That in our running away from God, the minute that fruit was eaten, God put in place a plan to get it turned around. Which tells me he's still allowing everyone to have the freedom, but he's also given the opportunity to, to get it corrected. Yes. Well, his ultimate goal is to restore the relationship that they initially had. That's right, because God, what God created was good. Sin came in and it dropped it down. As what Walker always said, we didn't, we lost our humanity in sin. We became less than human. So, and in Christ, He's restoring that humanity once again. And it's it's a very theological way of looking at it. <clears throat> that as believers in Christ, in faith, by God's grace, even though we're not perfect, even we still sin, we still are brought back into the level of humanity God created us to be. And when you think about it in those terms, and theology is very real and very practical, if you can think, in Christ I'm human again, it should shape how you live your life. And Walker went on to say that in the New Testament we're described as the royal family of God. And he says, when you look at royalty, there are certain things the royal family will not do simply because they're part of the royal family. We're part of the royal family. We're part of humanity in it. again. So live like it. Live up to what you've already attained in Christ. And when we do that, then we have this freedom. There's no more reason for laws. 
if we love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we love one another as God loved us, you're free to do what you want. But what you want is to please God. And that's the goal of our life. And it's restoring us to be the way back, the way God originally intended it until sin entered. And when sin entered the world, when disobedience entered the world, it changed everything. Like it says, it changed the relationship we had with one another. It changed our relationship that we have with our God. And Paul even said it changed the physical world itself. That sin is that devastating. Because in Romans he says this world <coughs> is groaning and travail. Waiting that day to be free. So... So in, in make a metaphor, in, in communion, we're we restoring, <clears throat> celebrating the restoration of that relationship with God and with our fellow man. It is. We're celebrating, I should say. Out of curiosity, Paul, I follow Amy's question. So are there are there religions who believe in predestiny? Oh yeah. And so Presbyterian. Oh they do? Yeah, yeah they passed the story of the guy who believes so in it that well, Dr. Richardson met a guy that was a, what he called the hard shell Baptist. And he believed, but he didn't have this experience of salvation, so he just believed he was unsaved. Yeah. That's the place of being. And that's because in, in predestination, if you are a strict Calvinist, before the foundations of the world was laid, God already knew whom he would save and whom he would not. And I'm just sitting there. That's not a very good guy. Our pastor. Which group am I in? <laughs> Our pastor in Canada, we went to a Presbyterian church simply because that's what was available. But he said he believed we would be judged more as a church than as individuals in the Presbyterian. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, because we were all we're all going to stand and make an account and. And like I said, there's a couple of judgments. Christians are missed the first judgment. We're going to be judged in our relationship with God through Christ. And if we have that faith and it's real and genuine, we're saved from any of that judgment because immediately that excludes all the non-believers. But then even Christians will be judged by how they live that faith out in terms of doing good works. And not everyone's perfect, but all the imperfectness will be burned away. The dross destroyed. Because you got to remember, only the pure holy can stand in the very presence of God. God cannot stand anything in his presence that isn't pure holiness. And we're not pure holiness here. But through that, we are purged of all that. Through Christ, Paul says we'll suffer loss, but we won't lose the most important thing. So when you have a life of faith, build it on the precious stuff, gold, silver, and the precious stones. Don't build it with all the draws, the sticks, straws, and, sto and stones, you know, that will be, that have to be burned away so that your purity is made pure. Does that make sense? Sure. But anyway, the presence of this chapter is the reason we have a savior is because of sin. And sin is devastating because now we're going to get a pronouncement of judgment on that sin. And, so, and it's in three levels. First to the servant, and to the woman, and to the man. And the order in which all this transpired. And so God, the Lord God said to the servant, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. So, you want to know why snakes are feared? <laughs> and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, there's that fear, and between your offsprings and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And that 
last part of verse 15 is what people see as the first Christological promise in the whole Bible. Do you know what I mean by Christological? Christ, Christ, a lot of words of Christ. Because he shall bruise your head. Well, we'll have to take the second part. And you shall bruise his feet. You will, you will die. You think you've won, but you only bruised him. But he shall bruise your head. Ultimately, in Christ, Satan is defeated. Even though on Friday morning, as this one preacher, black preacher said, Friday morning, and the devil's dancing. Why Friday morning? But Sunday morning is coming. Mm. And Com Compolo, Tony Compolo, says he heard one of his best Easter sermon, Easter morning sermon, built on the phrase, it is Friday that Sunday's coming. And, and so this verse kind of gives us that promise that you're going to think you're okay, but in the end, Christ will prevail. So that's the curse to the serpent. And this, it says, and I will put enmity yeah. between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. That is a good thing. Uh, well, one way of looking at it, most women are afraid of snakes. Not all of them, but most women. And it's this fear. But there's always going to be that conflict between Satan and all her offspring. It's not going to be a good relationship. There's conflict. And it's going to be an ongoing conflict. And when I, I was just at the minister's Bible study this Tuesday, and we were talking about this, this and I said, you've got to realize, you know, we think Jesus was only tempted once in the wilderness. Those three temptations followed him his whole ministry. And, and he had to be really too. careful of that. Turn these stones into bread. That's the miraculous. Give the people what they wanted. And Jesus knew they came and followed him and wanted stuff from him because he fed them, he healed them, he was giving them what they wanted. That was a, a temptation he had to fight the whole time. Well, the Pharisees were constantly trying to get him to make a mistake. Or well, that, but the other temptation is to do the glory, you know, jump off the right. temple and do the spectacular. And nothing will happen to you and, huh? and people follow, follow you and, or just bow down to me and I'll give you the whole world. And Jesus fought those his whole ministry and to trying to put him in perspective. Let's get going. And to the women. I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Which is always interesting to me. At this point in time, she has no baseline to work on how much more pain she's going to have. Does that make sense? Of course, I'm the only one that looks at stuff like that. I mean, increase, what is childbearing? <laughs> what does pain mean? <laughs> That's true. Mine says sorrow also, multiplied by sorrow and yeah. by conception. And yeah, there is that idea that, but my question is, how does she know? There's no, there has not been a birth yet. But again, it's laying, why do things happen? Why is there pain in childbirth? Because of sin. And then it says, you, your desire shall be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And this is the first time in all the Bible we move from an equality to a hierarchy. You stop right there. That's, that's all we need to know. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, um, well, you know, uh, he, he, I kind of get that. You know, she 
took the fruit and ate it and gave it to him. But he didn't put up any resistance. No. So what makes him so, so special? special. <laughs> <laughs> He's bigger. Well, <laughs> if you were the Apostle Paul and being a rabbi is because she tripped first and then tempted him, then he would have the higher role, she had the subservient role. She t tricked him? She didn't trick him. She I thought you said she tricked him. She tripped him. Tripped him out. Okay. Okay. Because of her, he took. He had free will. So, the idea though, what I want to point out, <laughs> this hierarchy <laughs> scheme <laughs> of God, Christ, man, woman, child, and dog is the result of sin. But in Christ, that hierarchy is again put back to equality. And I want to, I don't have my New Testament, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Uh, it's in Ephesians. What's it about? Children, obey your parents. Well, it's there, but is it this one? Do not slay. Depends on what we're listening for. Why a man overrules a woman? Oh, here it is. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your husbands, to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, the body, and is himself the Savior. So the idea is... That's not where I wanted it. Because the husband's also <laughs> supposed to love your wife. The whole yeah, idea is the what I'm like. It's a, you know, it isn't in the high, it kind of starts in the middle and makes a circle. And so even then, it's not describing a hierarchical <coughs> hierarchy, it is describing a circle of relationships. And so in Christ, that harmony of equality, although different, because in creation, the man and woman was different. They had their own responsibilities, but they were equal in it. After the fall, there became the hierarchy. How much time? <coughs> we'll get through this part. And, and then we'll go to Adam. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. And this is the punishment of sin on the earth. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your lives. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it which you were taken. And for you are dust and dust you shall return. So basically the curse on Adam is you're going to work your tail off and not get anywhere. The ground is not going to be your friend anymore. You have to work at it. And ultimately to the ground you will return because that's where you came. And so, um, let's see, how do I, where do I want to do it today? Don't have, well, we'll stop there. But I, this, this verse of, verse, last part of, for the, you are dust and dust, you, we are introduced to death. In fact, as we read on in the chapter 3, once they're expelled, God has to guard a certain tree. So these sinful people can't partake of it. So he puts a chair there. And uh, so in sin, it brought death. And eventually we're going to find out that it limited the uh, three score ten, around 70 years, give or take. So but in full disclosure, the Ephesians <clears throat> verse was that husbands shall love, uh, that the man will rule over the wife. But then it goes on, husbands love your wives as 
Christ and the church. So yeah, there is a circle. Water. And it is. And then yeah. it starts that whole thing, and it depends on which translation you read, where they break it. Usually, most people break it after the first verse. Right. And so it's not read in yeah. part with that. And that is to uh, submit to one another out of mutual whatever it is. It's a mutual submitting that shows its equality. So anyway, but but who wouldn't do anything for their mate if they were loved as Christ loved the church? Right. And that's the whole idea. You know, you, you'll get along with people if you <laughs> are meeting their needs and, and serving what they want. Like I said, most people come to me because they're not getting what they want, not because they're getting what they want. And as I said, you know, I'm kind of a, kind of a practical kind of person who basically the definition of marriage is need satisfaction. And if you're not getting your needs met, it causes conflict, anger, bitterness, strife until it comes apart. And so it comes down to expectations. What are you expecting? Well. Have you told them what you have expect, are expecting? That's what you're saying. And is that expectation realistic? And you work at all that, so, you know, those needs that you have in that relationship are being met. Because it is, when needs aren't being met, then things fall apart. And so, lots of ways to go there. But what, through Adam, his, his, uh, punishment is you work your tail off, not get anywhere, and you will, you will die. Death is introduced. 